The Diagnosis Facing the Storm A cancer diagnosis is like a storm. From whence it comes, few know, as they are startled by the fierce, ambitious winds determined to dismantle all manner of lives in the most destructive manner imaginable. Everything stored in the rafters of aspirations suddenly come tumbling down. Dreams, desires, hopes, torn away from the stripped structures of mere bones, rot, and flesh. Suddenly, nothing that was of importance in your daily life holds any significant measure to the prognosis that is staring you in the face echoing in the recesses of your startled mind. Your sights cast on the remnants of your shattered life as you rummage for purpose, reasons, or regrets. A piercing prognosis hurled in your direction determined to distract all the senses in a whirlwind of ghastly proportions can either stagger you or force you to succumb to the assailing insurgents against your very existence. For some, hearing the grim news, it may feel like you're a child again, subject to listening to a fearsome tale wherein the main character, you, must encounter all those monstrosities known as chemotherapy, radiation, and immunotherapies in effort to pass through the darkest forest of which many before you have never, ever escaped. Somewhere within that grim labyrinth as you struggle to trudge onward, you will arrive to kneel before the white porcelain thrones, toilets, of which you'll be forced to yield up all the strength, nourishment, and medicines you've ingested only to find a hideous reflection staring back at you in the stench of such ailing sessions. A glimpse of the creature you've become, rippling in the waters of regurgitation. In those sedentary moments, your stare cradled of shadow moons glances back at you in sore sway. Flush, flush the stink, the stranger away. For that sad face is not you. No way. You recall films you've seen depicting such sorrowful circumstances. Stories you've heard of people who fled this world during flurries of both treatments as well as experimental courses in desperate, determined efforts. They which suffered for naught faded into films like memories fraught to forget. Then, too, you've heard of those people who refuse all treatments, opting to allow what they deem as fate to determine their stay in the world, while refusing the wisdom of doctors and the aid of medicines to ease their terminal travail. Then, too, are the bucket listers, those who scribble all of their desires in a maddening dash to perform every one before the sands of their time runs out. Set up the donation accounts to seek pity, payments, and prayers from public that will be given pictorial updates as they live their experiences in deterioration and gratitude. Unless, of course, it's a child, stricken, who will accumulate the sympathies of many as well as big wishes from foundations connected to celebrities buns and snap snap flash shoots eager to give children a fun send-off into the next world. Perhaps you've even contributed to such feats or known family or friends who have died from the biblical pestilence known as cancer. I have all the medical and scientific terminologies strewn to offer you or your loved ones extensions on the prolonging of life at some point, usually in the initial stages, become as white noise in the preponderance of one's ominous writhe. What many patients do not understand is that 
what the physicians, the tests, the oncologists say regarding symptoms, diagnosis, and prognosis, and yet it is what Almighty God says that has the final authority in their case, whether they are Christian or not. Happily, I am a Christian and understand from the onslaught of my diagnosis, which was stage four cancer, which spread to my brain in 2016, that Satan was attempting to steal from me, my husband, my children, all the while trying to kill my faith, joy, and peace with the determination to destroy me. Oh, so now you're trying to say, that you see a tumor in my lung too, I said to the physician who announced the grim news with an entourage of colleagues. I felt the hands gently squeezing my own as I looked up at an angel standing beside me. It was as though he were speaking to me, his eyes telling me the day, the hour, and precisely what to speak as I turned away to stare back at the neurosurgeon. Tomorrow is my son's 21st birthday and I'm going to be home. I have a cake to bake and balloons to blow. I will not remain here while he is waiting, wondering where I am on his birthday. He has cerebral palsy, I stated, in a voice trembling as tears splashed from my eyes. Quickly I looked back at the angel whose face I sought for comfort, but he had disappeared. He was gone and in those moments... I knew that the spirit of fear had fled the room as I determined to leave. I had been discharged from the ICU trauma center against the advice of the neurosurgeon who had scheduled both a pre-op appointment for me and an early craniotomy surgery date a week after being diagnosed. I had suffered a seizure two days before my youngest son's birthday and by the grace of God was comforted by a peace through Jesus Christ when I awakened to such grim circumstances. I was given a large bottle of steroids to keep the swelling in my brain down as the tumor pushed against it, which had been the cause of the seizure, as I was told. I had known others who had had pestilence. My son had leukemia 20 years prior, and survived, whereas my best friend had expired from uterine cancer, having been given 12 months to live. My father had died 10 years prior, having had been stricken with colon cancer. Having seen my loved ones suffer, as well as many of the bulk dramas of beguiling films depicting the demise of portrayals, looping scenes of frailty, I did not stagger before the enemy because I knew that the battle was not mine, but God's. And all good happens for those who love the Lord, as in Romans 8.28. The first donation that came in purchased me a bedside flushing toilet that I presumed to be hurling into as my chemo treatments progressed. Certainly such a bedside throne was a simpler solution and racing down a long hallway in hopes to find the bathroom free for the gagging. It made sense, I thought, staring at the tank merely inches away. I could pop onto it whenever I wanted, needed to, for this was a convenience that felt like a luxury. My new battery working toilet even sported a tissue paper spool to yank on as well. I was blessed and ready for what may come. I thought, imagining myself vomiting upon return from having the tumor removed from my head and the appointed radiation sessions following. A week prior to those moments, while sitting, admiring my new bedside toilet, I recall myself having been angry, distraught, and full of anxieties about family, life, and work. I'd been full of grief over many things, mainly my eldest daughter's, one of which lived at home with little regard to improving herself and contributing to the household, whereas the other oldest daughter who lived afar had fled my life without concern, reason. I'd spent most days worrying about my eldest daughter and her self-serving lifestyle, wondering how to mend our relationship 
while simultaneously quarreling with the other daughter who refused to improve her circumstances or be an example for her younger siblings. How had I gone wrong? I've always been a Christian woman, prayed with my children and did my best at serving them all, all of their lives. Yes, life was difficult throughout the years with their father. However, I made it a point to never hurt, shun, or abandon them as I had been as a child. It made no sense to me. When I wasn't travailing to pay bills, the hours were dark with the consequences of supporting an adult daughter in her 30s who found it amusing to argue issues with me until I was left frustrated, fraught with exhaustion, and having no energies left to spend pleasantly on myself, matters I wanted to attend to with my husband or children. Not anymore, I decided, choosing to focus on every moment as God had given them to me. This was an important move, deciding not to give my adult kids power over my emotions, my energies, or time any longer. I had only days before I knew they would break into my skull to cut out the tumor. And I chose to spend every minute savoring, smiling, and loving those children who loved me the hours with my husband, whose trembling heart endeavored to hush silent in my arms, felt blissful to me. The storm stilled in my heart whenever looking upward towards heaven. It was as though I could feel the face of God staring down at me whenever searching the skies. A shrouding warmth wrapped around me in all such reverent, prayerful instances. If you want me, Father, I whispered secretly surrendering, I am yours.